The Secrets of Stargate is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Stargate, episode 47. General West Jackson has identified the seventh symbol. All right, here we go. We are about to try to make a connection. All we gotta do is bust out of here, commandeer the ship, and fly on home. Indeed. You say that a lot. I know that this could be dangerous. But this is our job, right? It's what we signed on to do. It was never about going home. It's about getting us to where we're going. Hi, I'm Jack Barazzini, and you're listening to The Secrets of Stargate, where we talk about the hidden meanings and deeper layers found in the Stargate movies, TV series, and more. And joining me today are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father. Howdy, Jack. And Lisa Jones. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Jack. And Victor Lambs. Hey, Victor. Hi, Jack. Today we're discussing the fifth episode of season two, Learning Curve. But before we jump into that, I, want, I have an exciting announcement uh, that we've gotten merch. If you visit uh, sqpn.com slash merch, you can get t-shirts, mugs, stickers, and more, including a beach towel with uh, our lovely faces on it, which means you can get a mug with our mugs on it. I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you, you can wear my face. Oh, that's Gary. I'm guessing the order right yeah, now. <laughs> Merchandising. Yeah. Merchandising. So uh, in addition to that, they also have uh, awesome shirts for uh, Secrets of Star Wars, Secrets of Star Trek, and Secrets of Doctor Who. And I feel like there needs to be like a, a collection where you get uh, each one that has Father Corey on it. So you get the Star Trek one, the Stargate <laughs> one, and the Doctor Who one. You to complete that set. There we go. There we go. Yeah, it's like, it's like those mugs they had in the 90s from Burger King with like the Star Wars characters on them. Yeah. <laughs> Same kind yes. of thing. <laughs> yeah. I think my parents probably have those somewhere. Nice. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so if you head on over to uh, sqpn.com slash merch, that's where you can grab all that awesome swag. All right, um, so here's the recap. The SGC is working with the Orbanians, a species whose children are extraordinarily intelligent. The team learns that these children, the Uroni, are implanted with nanites who give them extraordinary intelligence and learning capabilities. They also learn, to their horror, that after having learned a sufficient amount of new information, they undergo a ceremony that strips their nanites from their brains and disperses them into the Orbanian population in a mass data dump that essentially lobotomizes the children. Jack takes it upon himself to jeopardize interplanetary relations yet again and take the girl Marin out, of, out in the world to experience the full beauty of life as a child, which apparently means spending the day in an American public school. Though she enjoys the day, Marin still elects <laughs> to return and undergo the ovarium. SG-1 returns to the planet and visits the nursing home where all the for former Irone are kept, where Jack finds Marin finger-painting on the wall. And that is where we end this absolute uh, joyous, happy episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on this episode, Father? You know, it's... it's... It was one of those at first, it was kind of, okay, this is interesting, this is interesting. And then it's like, no, this is, you know, message of the week type. This is, you know, the after school special type episode, um, especially when Jack goes AWOL. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But yeah. Uh, what about you, Lisa? Um, I kind of liked it. It's like a twist of a dystopian, you know, society and um it is kind of dark and creepy in a way, like a lot of dystopian stories. But then, unlike so many, this gives you that feel-good hope at the end that they're changing their society. And then the, the other thing is that I love Christopher Judge and Richard Dean Anderson always play so well off children. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do uh, get a bit of that. And so um, that's always a plus in my book. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. And you, I thought today, since this was the first episode of Stargate that our son, Ben, ever saw, that I would have him say a few words about it. I came down one night, and like it was playing, so I went, okay, let me wa let's watch this. And I had no idea like what the story was supposed to be, and why Teal had a symbol on his head. I had no idea. So, like... When I first started Stargate Act Fate, that was like the first part where I really got amazed. So I watched. I was like, 
Okay, this is cool. Can I, it wasn't until like the second or third one that I actually started get, like understanding it. So I like I kept watching it more and more, and I, I under I I'm I'm understanding it a lot better now. Excellent, thanks Ben. And you'll see that we have some people here uh, to take you to your ovarium. So have fun. <laughs> All right. Now that he's gone, I can tell you what I what I think about this episode. Uh, I, I like it. These are the kind of episodes I, I like. They, you know, they they do have that sort of creepy, dark, um, you know, dystopian thing that science fiction is is so good at presenting. You know, a culture whose values are so different from our own, um, and yet. You know, Stargate is so good not having a prime director or anything like that. They're so good at showing how we can influence other cultures with our own, um, you know, sense of of morality there. And, you know, so at the end, I think it's, you know, it's it's a bittersweet episode, but it ends on a very hopeful note. And so I like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really liked it, too. This is kind of a, like my favorite kind of science fiction story where you get presented with this weird, dark world that you don't really know exactly how to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, I will say my, the, my biggest drawback is that I feel like they didn't really take the premise as far as they could have. Like the main conflict comes from Jack deciding to go AWOL mm -hmm. again. And I feel like it would have been more interesting if they'd done something where she asks for asylum because the way it's presented in the episode is their main, their whole issue is the way that this society treats their children and their values, which is, which I agree is wrong, but then they kind of just Jack just kind of forces what he thinks she mm -hmm. should be doing onto her. So it kind of just feels like even though he's more correct, it, it doesn't really drive that message home as much as if she had like asked for asylum right. and they'd had to uh, wrestle with that. I feel like that would have been a more interesting way to take this story. Well, the second half of the episode really felt like a MacGyver episode. Now, if you remember, you know, MacGyver's mm -hmm. course thought of, you know, oh, yeah, he got himself out of, you know, out of dangerous situations, built a nuclear bomb out of chewing gum and a pen and a pen, you know, but he had a lot of episodes. Richard Dean Anderson, especially towards the end of the series, had a lot of episodes where it was more about like he would go down and help kids at this, you know, YMCA or Boys and Girls Club in the inner city. And that's what this felt like when he, he went AWOL. And let's be honest, he flat out went away without leave. If, you know, a real military person had done that, forget being a colonel. How about like Leavenworth <laughs> is going to be your residence for the rest of your life type of deal? You know, right. and at that, that kidnapping, that, yeah, kidnapping and kidnapping the, a, a visiting yeah. dignitary. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's just like, and then he put her into this public school where she figured out how to paint. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, and, and, and I, I agree. There was a lot of this episode that you know, I liked because it was kind of the dark and, oh, this is wonderful. And the kids are so thrilled to be doing this role where they're basically child labor. And oh, by the way, it, we lobotomize them and they go and live happily ever after in a nursing home. I like that, that phrase, you know, a nursing home, <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. just like this. It, you're, I agree with both of you or the three of you. This is good, dark science fiction. And then we switch into Rich, Richard Dean Anderson's part. Yeah. And that's really what it felt like, because you notice there's no consequences. Jack O'Neill mm -hmm. has absolutely no consequences for going AWOL. There, he gets the little, right. we'll talk about yeah. this later from General Hammond. And that was about yeah, it. And I'm sure. Yeah. And in the next episode, it's not going to be brought up. <laughs> no, but. he's not all of a sudden <laughs> lieutenant colonel or something like that. You yeah. know, he didn't get demoted. He didn't lose pay. He just kind of, <laughs> oh, well. He gets called into the chief's office. It's like, dang it, O'Neill. <laughs> this is the last time it'll turn in your gun. Oh, buddy, you're 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 such a good cop, O'Neill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The dirty, hairy type treatment. <laughs> yeah, you you can't yeah, shoot so off half the, the city next time. Just don't do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like this is at least the second time he's done something similar, where it's getting to a point where you don't want you don't want the leader of your forerunner team being such a loose cannon in these diplomatic situations because that's how you set off like an interplanetary war. Exactly. So, you do if you like are running a TV show, though. I think. Like, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it interesting. Right. But yeah, it was a, and I liked, um, I like how Sam and Daniel both approached the situation where they almost viewed it like they they viewed it as wrong, but they were coming at it from an entirely different angle than he was. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it was nice to get those different perspectives from the characters. And for once, Daniel wasn't, um, you know, saying, oh, well, that's just how they do it. Yeah. Right. Right. He, he seemed kind of equally as horrified or upset about it as the others. And I was, you know, you're, you're giving him a, like a little golf clap, you know, thanks. Finally, you, you're not just saying, oh, it's a different culture. It's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, like he does, you know, in... And I, and I do love episodes. how, like, Daniel doesn't get to, like, reveal the big mystery of this episode. It's like, why did the ghoul leave this planet of, like, the oh, Aztec right. children and stuff? And he's like, this will finally explain everything. And then they, like, never come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, let's yeah. just move this. And we'll, this this bureau is going to explain everything. And then it's like they get lost in the, uh, you know, ethical plot here. And, and they never get back to that, which, yeah. <laughs> which right. I'm kind of yeah. glad, too. I mean, it's it's it just, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. two the two side plots, which are the Aztec ruins on the planet, and then the uh, Nakoda reactor, those are just to just mm-hmm. they just serve to reveal the the main dilemma of the episode. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. and I do like how the or Urbanians they don't really. It's not like they're sinisterly hiding this. They just don't realize that anyone would have a problem with it. So I, yeah. I like how it's right. it's not done as like, oh, we're going to hide this. It's just that's how they do things and they don't realize that people yeah. have a problem with it. What do you mean you don't? Everybody does this. You know, it's that kind of... <laughs> yeah. what, what is this learning thing? We, we, we don't know how to do learning. You know? Right. Like, you and, wonder... and as Carter said, they've learned faster. You know, they've done in decades what it took humans hundreds of years to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in in their mind, it's why would why would we not? If we're trying to advance our civilization, this is a very efficient means of yeah. doing it. And it's it's weird that like you have to wonder if like having these nanites like affects their perception of time because we're told that it's been only forty nine years since they've been doing this, which there would be people over forty nine years old who would remember kind of like the old way, and yet it's like, what is this learning of which you speak? You know, <laughs> what is this? What is this? Children, you know. And yeah. um, if it had only been 49 years, then there would be people. It's like, well, yeah, we used to, you know, have to go to school or. Yeah. Pa- Passed down from generation yeah. to generation, our knowledge, right. you know. Yeah. Chris, maybe they're not getting the nanites. <laughs> maybe they're, uh, maybe yeah. they're the ones yeah. taking care of the kids in the nursing home. Yeah, right? exactly. There was a nanite mandate and they just opted out. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you would figure that the kids that had the nanites would naturally learn on their own. Just from the exposure mm-hmm. to their aides, if nothing else, you know, the, the nurses and everybody at this, this, the center, you think they would figure out, hey, they can learn a more traditional way as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think they had Frazier kind of preempt that discussion because she said that since they got their nanites so early, it prevented any pathways from establishing in their brains, which took them back to infanthood. Yeah, that's still kind of yeah, pseudoscientific, yeah, was, though. I mean, you'd think the yeah, kids would still yeah, the develop the pathways really. after that. But they can still, they didn't it's go back to motor tale. skills yep. of a baby. Yeah. The technology is just there to kind of hand wave the yep. issue. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. yeah, and I feel like there's plenty of ways they could have gotten around this because I guess everyone gets like a single nanite from the kid. So these mm-hmm. are all the non Arone children everyone else gets the nanites which contributes to their intelligence but right. it's like couldn't they just have a stock of everyone like if there's all these nanites why don't you just leave some in there like well there's also it yeah the, oh yeah well they, they, they give they, them be, like an extra 50 nanites or well they, they explained yeah. basically that the nanites couldn't remain in the kids once the kids had learned and then had them removed right. they couldn't go back in oh, yeah, although right. they broke that at the end because then all the kids are sitting there playing because of what right. Marin learned and so it's like uh-huh uh-oh yeah they didn't follow their own logic there yeah and this is also the situation you run into a lot with sci-fi where if a nanite is a computer why can't you just copy the data onto some more nanites <laughs> <laughs> ask voyager's doctor who you can only have one copy yeah, exactly. of <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know, why don't they replicate the nanites somehow? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have like some nanites that are replicators of some sort. Oh, yeah. spoilers, spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> couple, couple more episodes. Yeah. They can just uh, do it like you did uh, in the early 2000s where you're just burning uh, CDs and then sharpening them on. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> get, your, get your nanite burner out. <laughs> Buffer under on error. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now that well, I did like it that the SGC or the Stargate personnel didn't just get to say, "You're wrong, this is unethical, and you must listen to us." And the people go, "Oh my gosh, you're so right!" Yeah, mm-hmm. and change their ways. That they they found a solution to the problem. I mean, the writers found a solution to the problem that didn't involve just lectures and learning. Yeah, but it was kind of an unintentional, you know, fun way to to show the progress yeah. so i like that way around it yeah. versus just like so many shows where they just want to beat you over the head with something and then at the end the person's like oh you got me yeah i agree like we've got the prime directive but we're still going to lecture you about how you should live exactly. you never hear that in tng <laughs> and voyager and <laughs> right and i like how this ends up the effect is the same as the prime directive but it's from a much more realistic, pragmatic stance of we can't go around and just tell other people what their value system should be because no one is going to want to deal with us Mm -hmm. as we're coming into the galactic stage. And that's also because humans are not the ones on top here, unlike in Star Trek. So they have to play nice. Yeah, but the Tari still find ways to to mess things up. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I I like that we we got our first look at an Equator reactor in Mm -hmm. this one. And, and it doesn't look, yeah, and it doesn't look at all like the the human built Naquita reactor, which is pretty much what's kind of cool is the way Carter's like when she's describing like how they could build one. That's pretty much how they look for the rest of this series mm-hmm. and then into Atlantis mm-hmm. and stuff. So that that part's really cool. Um, they don't always look like Borg cubes or, you know, yeah. models of Borg cubes <laughs> <laughs> there. So it's really cool to see such an essential piece of technology, um, you know, from the show mm-hmm. going here on out, like introduced for the first time well that's mm-hmm. that's something okay. we've said that i think we we all kind of enjoy about stargate is we see earth starting to develop these technologies you know they, they start learning about mm-hmm. the technologies that's out there and using them and how they perf- process from there you know so right it's nice to see a new piece of technology invented and then they remember that it exists in the next episode because that happens a lot in star oh, trek yeah. where they have this brand new device that solves all these problems. And then <laughs> next time they need something like that, they don't bring it back up. So mm-hmm. it's nice mm-hmm. to see they keep the continuity with the advancement in the technology. <laughs> okay. Who else chuckled that Carter just turns on a. Yeah. Nacoder. You know, like yeah. <laughs> just doesn't let anyone know, Hey, I'm testing something, nothing. And then just hits the switch and the wish- pulse goes yeah. out. Yeah. That sets off all the alarms yeah. on base. <laughs> <laughs> she reverses the polarity first. Yeah, oh yeah. She's trying to puzzle out why she's trying to puzzle out why this like highly complicated reactor isn't working. She's like, but if we reverse the polarity now, was it the polarity of the neutron flow? I don't, yeah, that's all, I don't for those know, who don't know. That's like, that, that was yeah. like the third doctor for Doctor Who. Yeah. That was like his tagline. Oh, yeah. I have to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. Neutron Every flow, problem is solved by reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. Nice. I was trying to remember if that was a Doctor Who reference or uh, or a Jordy LaForge reference. No, I, I think Jordy LaFor- <laughs> Jordy LaForge had the uh, reverse polarity as well. So I, I wonder if this was a callback to both TNG and Doctor Who, because yeah, it was always reverse the polarity, the neutron flow, problem fixed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Although I could see a situation where a scientist would get so wrapped up in what they were doing that they just didn't tell anyone. In, in, Giddy like I a mean, school child. <laughs> yeah. So if you reverse the polarity, is that plugging in the batteries backwards? <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. yeah. You've got a DC power yeah. input and you, re- you, you reverse it. You plug the negative into the positive and positive and negative. <laughs> yeah. Someone yeah, yeah, that's yes. what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but don't you wish you could have heard the other end of that conversation from General Hammond? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what on blank blank do you think you're doing right. down there? <laughs> it was a long it was a long conversation too because in that amount of time Jack was able to go you know get Marin, <laughs> yep. get in the elevator, go all the way up to the surface, like check out, you know, so it was uh it was a pretty long uh, uh reaming out there. I, I, I wish General Hammond. wish they would done like, you know, like you, you hold the phone, you could just kind of hear and you hear the <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's got to hold it away from her. Yeah. It's so loud. Yeah. <laughs> and so I guess, is he just calling in a favor with that teacher when he takes Marin to that school? Well, you notice the kids all seem to know yeah. who he was too. 
Yeah. Because that's where he took Cassandra, right? I think Cassandra was... Was yeah, it? they made a reference yeah. to Cassandra. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah but this is, the, uh, this, is, this is where the MacGyver part started, where, you know, MacGyver yes. was known mm-hmm. at these schools because he was always working with them. And, of course, apparently so was Jack O'Neill going to these schools <laughs> and working with them. They had a problem the with the... Uh, they had a problem with the drug cartels at that elementary school and <laughs> yeah. O'Neill was able to kind of like go die hard on them and take them out. And so they kind of owe him. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my head cannon. Exactly. He stopped the kids from snorting Smarties. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Pop rocks. The kids are hopped yeah. up on goofballs. <laughs> and I do wonder, it almost felt like they ran out of story and they let uh, Richard Dean Anderson just kind of stick in his thing that he wanted like his his little message thing because it it really just kind of it just feels jarring because mm-hmm. like there's a lot going on and then you get this whole mm-hmm. chunk of the episode that's just like like you said like saturday morning like feel good story and then you cut back to there's a bunch of essentially lobotomized children in this institution yeah and that's i wonder if i i can see you know, again a lot of the decisions on MacGyver for stuff like this was Richard Dean Anderson. I can see Richard, him saying, if I'm going to keep doing this show, I get to do something. I get to have these kind of things put in here somewhere. And they just said, okay, yeah. we got this basic storyline. Let's just throw it in here because it works. And let him have his, you know, third of an episode that he can do his feel good, go to the school part. Right. And then we shoot people later, next episode. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the episode was written by Heather Ash. Yeah, she's written a handful of episodes, was a story editor for most of season three. Mm. But yeah, wrote, wrote just a few, like five episodes, including this one. Yeah, Nothing that really wrote. jumps out. Yeah, one episode each in four, five, and six. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Well, she's story editor. Yeah. looks like she's basically story editor for season three. Yeah. So... So I, I wonder if it's also a situation where you have these different plot lines you want to put together and this is kind of like the grab bag of mm-hmm. we want to do the Nakodo reactor. We want to do this morality tale about these children. We want to give Richard Dean Anderson is I get to help kids out and, yep. you know, mm-hmm. the more, you know, little clip. Yeah, so I guess it might have just been something where they just yeah. threw that all together. <laughs> but you know what? I, it, I There's something about the way he acts with children. Like mm-hmm. the, the interaction with them that was, mm-hmm. and I thought the little girl just did such a fabulous job of the role. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Role. What is yeah. this play? I mean, she just, you know, she really did yeah. a great job of uh, Brittany, Brittany Irvin. Um, and the interesting thing is that she actually co starred again with Michael Shanks in an episode of Smallville that centered around the uh, Justice Society of America. Mm. So we had uh, Michael cool. Shanks as Hawkman, uh, Brittany Irvin as Stargirl. And then Brent State, who played Ferretti in the in the Stargate TV show, playing um, oh I forget his name, Doctor Fate or something. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so we had like three uh, three Stargate actors all playing different members of the Justice Society of cool. America in a season nine episode of a of a oh, Smallville. Nice. So cool. yeah, and, oh that's cool. And, and you know she did a really, really good job because she was only twelve years old when this episode came out. Yeah. And mm-hmm. playing about, you know, what, about 11-year-old kids, so about that age. So that's actually, you know, pretty impressive because that's one thing Hollywood loves to do is like, oh, yeah, this is an 11-year-old who is clearly almost, you know, old enough yeah. to drive, if not, you know, drink. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I, I was funny because I was re-watching this episode and I kept thinking, gosh, she looks familiar. She really looks familiar. So I had to look her up to see. I mean, this was obviously 27 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, who is she now and where do I know her from? And you're going to laugh. Hallmark. Oh, she's <laughs> oh, on Hallmark course. Channel. That's funny. <laughs> so she's a recurring character on Chesapeake Shores, which is a, <laughs> a drama on Hallmark that I've watched for years. So that's funny. There you go. <laughs> so she has uh, learned again, is what you're saying? Yep. Yes. Okay, yes. that's good. <laughs> well, she played uh she played light, lightning dust on my little pony friendship is magic Ooh, so all of our all of our brony lot. fans out there, there you go. <laughs> a lot of barbie movies i didn't look at those i bet i i bet i've seen those with my girls <laughs> so what you're saying victor is you're volunteering to do a secrets of my little pony 
Hey, if uh, if it gets my name on a, on a or gets my face on another T-shirt, yeah, uh, <laughs> on a, on a pony, no less. Maybe <laughs> Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie is the most favorite. Pinkie Pie, yes. Pinkie Pie. <laughs> and John Delancey, uh, Star Trek's Q, is a is a recurring character on on My Little Pony as well. Oh, that's really? funny. Someone yeah, someone like told me that one, once. I think. Yeah. Okay, did not know that. There you go, yeah. The number of episodes I've seen in My Little Pony, zero. <laughs> so I did not oh, know really? any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel about the the end of this episode? Because I I almost wish they just left it bleak. Mm. No, that's not Stargate. No, I don't know. I, it's got to be a good happy ending. <laughs> yeah. It was it was like kind of fun to for the see. Future. It was kind of fun to see them them out playing and having fun and yes, and actually being kids, you know, stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I mean that was, yeah, was and true. the excitement, just... the dad, right? Yeah, come, come quickly. Yeah. Now, now, yeah. if this was you know more yeah. recent TV shows, it'd be like Battlestar Galactica, and they all died, yes. you know. Yes, <laughs> all the kids no, died. I, I, I think I think the best moment of the show is when. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Andrew Airely, who plays uh, Kalen, is, is coming out there and he's like, he's come quickly. And then he's like, I am teaching him. You know, it's this whole new concept to him of like teaching. And, you know, it's just, you know, Stargate SG-1 made it made a difference in this in this society. And it's it's a really good ending. It's kind of like yeah. why I like this episode so much is because it does have this kind of bleak, you know, society. And then, you know, at the at the end, there's there's hope mm -hmm. for change. Right. And it's not again, it's not like they changed really how they were doing it. These kids still get their nanites taken away, all mm -hmm. this. But but now in the nursing home, they get to be played with and get to continue learning. And they might eventually become full members of the society again. There you go. Yeah. I would like to see a follow up episode about this species. Like if they ever make a new Stargate show, like mm -hmm. 25 years later, mm -hmm. where are these kids? Like that would be cool to see if they were able to tie that back in. Yeah, absolutely. No, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah. I don't know. They're, they're all students. They're all students at Michigan State. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are there a lot of really weird <laughs> students at Michigan State? Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> go whatever. Michigan yeah, State's go. Mascot go. Is. <laughs> yeah, Spartans. <laughs> <laughs> Green and white. Nice. It would be, uh, and I don't know if they do this later on, um, but. I would like to see an episode where, despite their best efforts, they don't, because of the like the geopolitics involved with this kind of operation, that they don't aren't able to affect a change, and they have to deal with that. Like I feel like, especially to kind of counterbalance the fact that Jack O'Neill just took her and kind of went AWOL with it, and he was threatened with court martial, but there's no consequences. So it'd be nice to see that they like the actual consequences from that, either from him actually having something happen with his, like with his responsibilities with the group or them seeing that despite our best efforts and despite everything we want to do, we cannot help in this situation. Like our hands are tied mm -hmm. by the bureaucracy. I feel like we've had episodes like that already, but I def I think there are, there is stuff like that in the future. If I remember where, okay. yeah, where they, yeah. they have especially, something where they just kind of wash their yeah. hands and okay, we've done what we can. Mm -hmm. Y'all blow mm -hmm. each other up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially, especially in Atlantis. We, we see a lot of that. And then, um, yeah, there's an episode with, with, uh, Renee Abersonois in it. That's mm -hmm. kind of like that coming up. It's a very good episode. I don't want to spoil anything about it, but, mm -hmm. um, nice. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I don't, I would not want the show to just be like that all the time, but it would be, it would be interesting to see that and see how the characters deal with that kind of situation. Well, then we get, we get the Tolan where, that basically, yeah. it, long term, mm -hmm. it comes back to bite them because they weren't able to affect any, mm -hmm. help them in their society. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. Okay, we haven't talked about Tilk and the little boy yet. Oh, <laughs> so, that was, oh yeah. That's so oh, funny. I like that. <laughs> Tell me everything you know about the Gawold and Tilk's just looking at him like, what? <laughs> what is like your they're... purpose here? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how did they do that without cracking up? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are probably plenty retakes. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. yeah. 
Hey, that was so perfect. Just the, their interactions. Cause they're almost, they're at the same level of just being very blunt. Mm -hmm. It's nice mm -hmm. to see them bounce off each other like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that. That was good. Yeah. And then, and then Teal to be so insistent that he won't move on with another child. Like mm -hmm. I must see this kid. Yeah. I did find it very, the, uh, the kid's name was Toman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They use that name again. Hmm. Seasons nine and ten of Stargate, they use that character's name again, but not in relation to this planet or these people. So I thought that was very interesting that they, you know, would do it again. That isn't. It was uh, late. It's an Ori episode. He was a okay. worshiper of the Ori, and if if you see nine and ten and you go look it up, you'll recognize him. Oh, okay. Like he's yep. Somebody you'll remember. Hmm. I don't know if you looked him up yet. Yeah. I suppose there's only so many uh, combinations of syllables in the universe, so well, you're going to get some. Gonna, yeah, there. it would make sense. You would have or overlap of names, you know, from other other cultures and other languages and whatever. So, are you just saying That's... that my last name is Jones? Yeah. <laughs> No, this is, I mean, and this is like the one factor that's kept me from being like an award-winning sci-fi author is because <laughs> I'm deathly afraid that any alien race name that I come up with would already be taken. And then somebody would say, oh, you just got that from, you know, David Nivens or something. Yeah. So what you do is you set your uh, epic science fiction uh, space opera 20,000 years in the future and you name your character Duncan Idaho. <laughs> oh man yes i do there you go <laughs> yeah <laughs> because that's not weird no well, victor all you got to do is just start using like you know the random syllable characters you know the random sp uh, special characters yeah. from different languages you know but make sure you, they're not the same language as you do them like a little bit of greek and a little bit of hebrew and a little bit of uh you know aramaic and a little you know <laughs> Well, the best thing I found is if you like put your fingers on a keyboard, you know, and like your home keys, and then you like transpose everything over one key to the right and then just start typing like normal, it looks exactly like Klingon. So you could probably come up with some pretty cool names <laughs> that way. Yeah. How Klingon was developed. <laughs> yeah. I had an idea for like a science fiction story where one of the characters is an alien, but because their language is impronounceable to humans, they just call him Bob. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's already been done. I, I, I really think there's done. something like that before. Right? That's that's kind of an old joke in sci-fi, though. Y your yeah, human tongue yeah. cannot pronounce my lang my my name, so call me, you know, Tim. You know, <laughs> something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some call me Merlin. Others, Tim. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> there are those who call me Tim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> hey did y'all have any other uh, thoughts on this episode I will say I was very jealous when Marin left to go back to the planet to have her avarium she got the 96 pack of crayons I, most I, I ever got was the oh, 32 yes, yes. I wanted the 96 did it have, it have the built in sharpener I think it did yeah oh, I don't know on the side yeah I, 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 want, I was jealous anymore. I want that I wanted that <laughs> Okay, but were you cringing inside that she had it in a in her fist yeah. and was like using it on a concrete wall? And all I kept thinking of is you're ruining the crayon, sweetie. You're like, gonna break yeah. it. You gotta, you gotta draw, keep the tip sharp on all the different oh, yeah. sides. <laughs> well, I mean, now now SG want uh, the SGC can just say, you know, hey, give us like three more Naquita reactors and we'll give you like four boxes crayons. of crayons. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you the yeah. 128 oh. color this time. Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair exchange. Although. Although I really did like the um, as, as Marin is heading back to the Stargate, she's holding the Naquita reactor and on top of it is the box of crayons. And I just thought that was like a really, yep. really nice image of like, you know, this highly technical and then like the innocence of the child on top of it there. Yeah. So no, that, that was, yeah, that was very a very nice visual. Yeah, great visual. Mm -hmm. And then I got a kick out of, you know, this 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 uh, as actually was pre Aztec uh, ruins. And it's mm -hmm. obviously a warehouse that they spray painted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It looked like the same warehouse from uh, the episode with um, Barclay. I can't remember the actor's name. Oh, oh yeah, the, the uh, yeah Dwight Schultz. It probably yeah. is. Yeah, Ta uh, gamekeeper. Yeah, 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 where his parents got got crushed by the mm -hmm. all the foam blocks. 
<laughs> we do have some we do have some pretty good like I would say early 90s, but this is late 90s to this point, like mm -hmm. digital matte compositing, like when they're outside and it's like, here's a pyramid and then here's like a technological city. And then here's like three people kind of, yep. <laughs> yeah, you know, it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. Freeze framed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I also loved that uh, a child stumped Carter. Yep. Yeah, that was yeah. good to see. <laughs> yeah. And then asked if uh, O'Neill was if Carter was smarter than O'Neill. <laughs> Are you a yeah. scientist? Carter and Fraser, yeah. 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 Oh, that's right. Girl power. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yeah. Overall it was a it was a good episode. I like when we get these more uh I guess they're more they're not they're not just like shoot 'em up action episodes. It it deals with more of a moral issue. Mm hmm Really it really does make you think about diverse cultures and societies and how, you know, very quick to say, this is my way is the right way. Your way is the wrong way. Mm -hmm. but in this instance, you stop and you think about getting to know the, why they do it, how they do it. And rather than trying to shut them down, how do we influence them to do better? Right. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. All right. You can't just go in and make them do a 180 all at once. You got to mm -hmm. plant those seeds slowly and just, be a positive influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, any other thoughts? Just minus 10 points for bringing up Brief Candle in this episode, <laughs> making a reference back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd left that behind Come me on. and I had to think about it again. You can see him twitching on the floor. He mentioned it. He mentioned yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotta take a shot of mustard or something. <laughs> yeah. Every time we mention it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, before we go, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Stargate, including Kathy R., Joan T., Ramona F., Brooke K., and Joel L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Stargate and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And be sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or on the SQPN YouTube channel. And to find previous episodes of Secret to Stargate and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash stargate. And you can email us at stargate at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at sqpn. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode of SG-1, Point of View. Until then, Father Corey, thank you for thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Stargate. Thank you, Jack. And Lisa Jones, thank you as well. Thanks, Jack. And Victor Lambs, thank you too. Thanks, Jack. And remember, fun is whatever you do when you're not learning to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Jack Barazzini. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Stargate on StarQuest. Anyway, I'm sorry, but that just happens to be how I feel about it. What do you think? <laughs>